We finally made it to Starfield Review Day, and hot damn, it's been a tumultuous past few months. Big game, big hype, even bigger drama, but we are here. And I, for one, am grateful that the wait is finally over. So let's fling open the vault doors and step out into the great universe beyond. Thank you to the crew over at Bethesda. I was given access to the game a full two weeks early, and I've tried to make good use of my time with Starfield. Now, after logging nearly 60 hours and hitting all parts of this game, there are two facts that have been made abundantly clear to me. First is that Starfield is massive, not only in the sheer size of the universe itself, but in meaningful content available to players. This is a game that will measure time played in months, not hours. And the second is that over those 60 hours, I saw a big fat zero on the bug scoreboard, confirming that this is the smoothest, most polished Bethesda launch product we've ever seen. Welcome back to the channel. It's Lieutenant Buzz Lightbeer, and here it is, my spoiler-free Starfield early review. And as you can probably tell from my voice, the gaming experience on tap was awesome. It's Oblivion in space with a different style of world building, and exploration. Now there are a few items that are not up to snuff and my critiques will point those out to you, but there's a lot packed into my review and I hope you enjoy it. If you haven't done so already, make sure to hit subscribe and ring the notifications bell to receive my latest upload alerts. Likes, comments, shares are greatly appreciated. Of course, chapters are ready and available for an easy viewing experience and away we go. My PC rig is admittedly a bit overkill, making use of an AMD Threadripper Pro 3975WX, 3090 GPU, and 256 gigs of RAM, but it is purpose-built to handle huge 4K render jobs and, in its free time, does stunt work for Cyberdyne systems. Using a mix of ultra and high settings, Starfield will generate FPS in the 50s and heavily populated areas on my setup and bounce up to the 60s when I hit outer space. Varied lighting effects, shadows, textures for the most part, and color palette all look to be present and looking pretty good. In general, Starfield is a good looking game that at times looks great, especially when outside the city limits. Now, once my recording software was switched off, I saw a 5 to 7 FPS bump, which was something we were alerted to in our review copy packets. And DLSS could be useful here once it is modded into the game. Now, three items that could be of great benefit to the settings menu are a field of view slider, frame limiter cap, and decent benchmark tool, all extremely valuable and all missing. Starfield presents an interesting dichotomy in graphical fidelity because it's capable of showcasing some highly detailed and stunning biomes, environments, and structures, but can then turn around and give you a glimpse of the old Sega Genesis cutting edge visuals. Pop in at medium to longer draw distances is present, and once you focus on textures that are slightly off your main sight lines, you'll see that either the game engine itself or FSR just can't do the math fast enough to give you crisp fidelity across the entire image. Bug Eye Syndrome does show up in larger non-essential NPC crowds, and details like realistic hair physics and skin tone and complexion are still lacking. You can definitely see the improvements over Fallout 4 or Skyrim, and when you are planetside or out in space, Starfield can produce some amazingly beautiful visuals. Just expect it to scale back the minute you touch down in a populated starport. Gunplay is fast-paced and tight. Not Battlefield type, but dramatically improved over the floatiness of Fallout 4 or the general jank of Skyrim. Now, the arsenal at your disposal varies widely, and there's something here for every type of playstyle. You've got rifles with varied fire types like full auto or three round burst, energy weapons, grenade launchers, rail guns, and even a portable mini Gatling gun. I tried a John Wick setup with a silenced handgun and shoddy, which I highly recommend. There's also the option to just go only use me blades with combat knives, axes, and swords. Or for the ultimate Mike Tyson punch-out enthusiast, you can turn your targets into chunky tomato soup using only your fists. And of course, the splinter cell stealth mode is always a popular option here. No matter which way I went, the controls overall felt tight and steady. 
feedback when connecting with targets was instant, and recoil was predictable. AI gets a nod here as well, as enemy combatants no longer charge mindlessly at your position. You will see a varied mix of melee rushers, mid-range shootouts, and various explosives hurled at your position. Enemy soldiers now attempt to use cover and strafe, while heavier veteran targets feature a segmented armor bar, giving them fallout levels of resistance, but now in a compressed display directly over their heads instead of at the very top of the screen. Vats are a thing of the past, so it's mono e mono as you blast your way across the universe. There's also all types of robotics hell-bent on ending your space adventures, and creatures vary from docile to extremely aggressive, with some quests ending with boss battles versus huge beasties requiring patience and a metric ton of ammo. Loot drops pretty much from anywhere, from anything, and typically the higher level target that is downed, the higher the chances of getting the best loot. Rare, epic, and legendary tiers of gear, weapons, and resources are out there, and each tier of gear will add on one additional bonus effect. Lockpicking supply caches is also very useful in this regard, and can be upgraded as part of your skill tree. Consumables are very much that X factor, the extra flavoring in this recipe of disaster. And there's everything here, from extra melee damage to damage resistance to increased movement speeds. Out of ammo? Get pumped up on Starfield's equivalent of Jet and Psycho. Pull out your old axe and go full Last of the Mohicans, because the clock is ticking and the universe is calling. Now, aiding in the speed of Starfield's combat is the newly added third dimension of verticality via the boost pack, both in and out of combat. You'll find yourself bringing down death from above or boosting into the fray, and the difficulty ramps up as the gravity goes down. Zero G or near zero G combat is intense and takes planning, but when cranked up to full throttle, combat becomes this frenetic ballet of sprinting and shooting, hurling explosives, boost packing to vantage points, popping med packs like candy, and looting down bodies mid combat for even more supplies. It's gritty, pseudo tactical, rewarding, and I loved every damn second of it. Until you hit the orbital boosters into space, and this was really hit or miss for me, starting off with flying your ship in space combat. I came to grips with it, but I never truly embraced it. You see, ship controls, especially using mouse and keyboard, are both floaty and lethargic. I ended up dialing back the sensitivity to near zero, just to give me some semblance of control, but it was like wrestling against Andre the Giant each and every time I entered the fray. Oftentimes, you were thrust into these 4v1 battles, or even these random legendary ship encounters, and having full mastery of your ship's controls is imperative for victory, and I just never felt comfortable with this part of Starfield. Gauging turn angles or bank angles is difficult due to the limited FOV, and there's also a mechanic of salvaging destroyed ships for ship parts, which are essentially health kits used for hull repairs, and locking onto these things and bringing them into your inventory while in full-on combat is next to impossible. Both of these items could get better with adjustments, but as it stands, this was my least favorite part of the entire game. Outside of combat, boarding your spacecraft and blasting off into space is a thrill each and every time. Hearing the thrusters with that overdriven bassy note of distortion hitting you in the center of your chest like a woozer set on level 10 just never gets old. Once a system is discovered and unlocked, as long as it's within grav drive distance, you can dial it up, fold space, and be there in a matter of seconds. Planets and moons can be scanned from space for a general idea of point of interest locations and resources, and these scan results can be further enhanced through your skill trees. Now technically, you can fly from planet to planet within a system, but it will take you a bit of time, even using your ship's limited boost reserves, or you can use the fast travel system, at which time you get a brief animation and you arrive at your destination a few seconds later. Landing on planets gives you the option to choose an area of interest, or you can just randomly pick a zone and put her down there. It's your call, with full planet exploration available, but not continuous circumnavigation. Now once planet side, the sky's the limits for climates and weather conditions. Burning radiation, freezing cold, raging dust storms out of nowhere, even day and night cycles, you're gonna be seeing it all. And if you are exposed to these conditions, even wearing a full on protective spacesuit, 
that can lead to you getting afflictions such as hypothermia, radiation poisoning, and a whole lot more. And here's where having the good sense to stock up on your space brews and potions really pays off. Flora and fauna can be farmed and scanned for cataloging. Random structures can be searched for loot. Larger areas could be inhabited, either by friendlies or the other sort. And depending on your talents chosen here when first creating your character, you could end up getting jumped by bounty hunters, which also happens in space. Running around planet side makes you appreciate your oxygen bar, essentially your stamina meter, and increasing that for later in the game is not a bad idea. And here's where you also get to take full advantage of those booster packs. Options abound here, and Starfield gives you back as much as you give. Through the robust character creator, allowing for hours of customization, down to the literal arch of your eyebrows and optional scarring, to the position of tattoos and your character's neck shape, there's enough detail here to make a three hour long breakdown video and still not cover it all. Same with the ship customization and the ship creator system. You see, eventually you're going to outgrow your aging starter spacecraft and need to stretch your interstellar wings to better and further destinations. And here is where you can either purchase a prefab ship or go full handy manny and take an existing ship frame and create your own. In my near 60 hours of logged playtime, I tried out both, and they each have pros and cons. You see, purchasing a prefab unit is simple. No fuss, no muss, but there is a significant bump in the price tag for one of these units because you're paying for the convenience factor. Modifying an existing frame or going full ground-up construction is both rewarding and allows for some unique designs, but forces you to learn the snap map functionality of building something from scratch requiring the patience of a saint as you go through tons of trial and error. Now in the end, I spent about 10 minutes creating my character and two hours sculpting my buzz killer bird of prey ship, complete with blacked out paint job and more firepower than the damn Death Star. Character background skills and traits allow you to dip your toes in the proverbial options ocean as you progress out of the starting tutorial. Background selections are offered in preset packages like Cyber Runner, Ronin, and Space Scoundrel, and each background includes three skills already with the first prerequisite unlocked. After that, three more challenge levels will need to be met and points spent to reach mastery level on a skill. Four points total spent if the skill is not part of your background. Skill upgrades are immediately felt. They're weighty and produce instant results, especially when tied to damage output. Grinding out rank up points takes time, a lot of time. Think oblivion time, and you've arrived at a fitting analogy. But reaching mastery level on a skill allows for all-in build approaches, taking specific skill tracks to the extreme. Weapon mods and crafting can also have dramatic positive effects on your character's damage and resistances, requiring players to loot specific items and or spend points into skills to achieve enough knowledge to allow the crafting to take place. Starfield throws a multitude of options at players, like customizations for your suit and weapons, outpost unlocks, general consumables and medication crafting, and a lot more. Now luckily the game gives you the option to tag a specific mod or crafting item for needed requirements, and it will show the player an icon when a specific item needed for a mod or crafting project is in a loot pile. And one item that is completely missing, at least it was for me and my review copy, was an in-game store. So no microtransactions that I can see, no loot boxes, no weapon skins, no spacesuit cosmetics, other than those contained in the pre-order bundles. Now I suppose it could be run through the Creation Club, but this is great to see Bethesda not installing this into the live game. Combat, ships, exploration, a never-ending space setting, and a balls-to-the-wall skill and customization scheme is all for naught if the arena to showcase those mechanics is not well thought out. And in this regard, Bethesda has hit a towering home run with its overall writing and mission design. Now, the entire main storyline is off-limits to discussion in this early review because it's way too spoiler-heavy, but trust me, you'll enjoy it. And this is where you're going to encounter this unique use of the new Game Plus mechanic. But with all that being said, faction quest lines are still fair game. And 10 to 15 hour faction story arcs are the norm in Starfield. This is where you get to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of the Terror Morphs. You get to see mech graveyards and live out your darkest space pirate showdown fantasies. Each and every time you finish a task off your checklist, another, 
more dangerous, more daring requirement takes its place. Now, the writing is original, gritty, immersive, and in many regards outshines even the main storyline. This is Bethesda at its best, telling stories. Even a harmless side activity took me almost an hour and a half, laughing at traditional fetch me quests and saw me answering a distress call on Earth, meeting with homesteaders in the far reaches of the galaxy, restoring communication satellites, taking on swaths of space pirate ships, and eventually culminating with me just going full Leonidas on a space station full of baddies and all for a quote unquote side activity. Much of the Constellation Companions I'm going to leave for you to discover in your playthroughs, but like previous Bethesda titles, they tend to not move much of anything when in dialogue mode, although the voice work is top shelf, allowing you to forgive their mannequin-like appearance. Now, players are met with an overwhelming amount of dialogue options from empathy to apathy. Being rude is met with rudeness. Attempting persuasion is always an option, but requires a bit of savvy and good listening skills as you look for a crack in your target's defenses. And then there's always option C. Kill first and just forgo the questioning. One of my personal favorites, but not always the wisest choice. Sound design in Starfield is also exceptional. From the whir of aircon units to door and hatch openings to muffled discussions you can hear through walls, you get a true sense of a pressurized living environment. Likewise, weapons and combat related zips and zaps and explosions are unique. Ship booster sounds are always impressive. And all the while, Enon Zur's soundtrack sets the mood in the background, jumping between ethereal spiritual backgrounds to driving combat tracks heavy with percussion. I'm a stickler for sound design in my gaming experiences, and Starfield did nothing but impress me in this area. I personally don't like putting scores on games, as so much of this is subjective. You know, one person's delight is another person's disgust. But the positives far outweigh my small list of grievances with the game, and I would play Starfield firmly in the definitely must buy, highly recommended gaming category. Strong pros include high levels of polish and a bug-free experience at launch, beautiful storytelling with robust and weighty quest lines, and a grounded NASA punk style that mixes the unknown with reality. Now, I have no idea how long this game's content has been estimated to take, but it feels like hundreds, maybe thousands of hours, with extra DLC slated to drop early next year. That being said, there's still work to be done here on the base game, including revamping those disconnected flying controls, adding in some much needed QOL features and getting some of the rough texture models dialed in. I supported Bethesda through Skyrim, Fallout 4, and then was met with the cold sting of 76. But with Starfield, they've once again stamped their name as a leader in the RPG genre. And I can't wait to see what the next quest line has in store for me. And that's going to wrap it up for my early review of Starfield. Leave me any questions you may have, and I will, of course, do my best to answer them. Remember to hit subscribe and ring the notifications bell to receive my latest upload alerts. Likes, comments, shares are greatly appreciated. All my socials can be found in the video description below. A huge shout out to the over 148,000 of you that have stuck with me and hit subscribe. And a special thanks goes out to my patrons and to those of you firing over those awesome YouTube super chats. Until the next one, this is Lieutenant Buzz Lightbeer, signing off.